Okay, look, I've had just about enough, okay? <laughs> I have been trying for like the past two days or so to get my thoughts in order to record this stupid video because I've had enough of seeing so many negative reviews about this one book <laughs> that I think, in my opinion, is pretty good, okay? <laughs> My goodness! <laughs> Hi, hello, welcome to the video. If you don't know who, know who I am, my name is Neko Calico. <laughs> and I do random stuff on his channel, one being this, of all things, a book talk that I am trying to figure out what to do, essentially, <laughs> from here on out. So, for those of you that are n not my new viewers, this is going to be a little different from what I normally do, which is, you know, usually different reactions to videos and vid and games, even though I don't have really many right now. Um, but moving on, <laughs> I am here to give a, a review and an opinion on what I think was a really good book because I have not read books in a long freaking time, okay? <laughs> like the last time I, re I read a book was probably maybe five years ago. I mean like genuinely sat down, f like forget about homework, forget about social life and sat down and read a book. And that became my thing for the, like the next two to three days, okay? <laughs> and for me, that was this book. This has helped me get back into reading again. And it's, in my opinion, a very good book. For those of you that are not familiar with this book, <laughs> A Court of Thorns and Roses, or Akutar as the fandom calls it, is a romance romance fantasy book about a huntress, Feyre, trying to keep herself and her family alive due to a promise she made with her dying mother. One day out in the woods, Feyre kills a fairy disguised as a wolf, and about a day later, she is faced with the High Lord of the fairy she killed, and is forced to live the rest of her days in Perinthian, or the fairy realm. Essentially, a life for a life, as decreed by the treaty between fairies and humans that ended a long-lasting war that happened between happened five centuries ago in the timeline of the book. That is my spoiler-free part of this video because I have been trying to do this for two days now <laughs> and I just for the life of me could not get all my thoughts together so I'm just gonna rant a little bit about it and just talk about what I what what I thought made this book great and prove to many people and reviewers who did not like this book on things that made this book very appealing to me using evidence you know like we're supposed to do as critical thinkers and you know whatever <laughs> that being said i'm not gonna go into the whole writing aspect of this video meaning i'm not gonna really dive too much into how the the author sarah j mass wrote the book because as a person myself who writes things from time to time Everybody has a different way of writing, okay? So I have no room to judge either because I don't have a, a degree in literature or English of any kind or even creative writing. I just do this for the fun of it. And I am just so fed up with so many people talking crap on this book <laughs> when I have just started reading it and it's just it's given me major discouragement to continue reading and i have and i like i literally at the time of this recording i am just in the middle of reading a court of mist and fury right now which is the second book in the series and that being said i'm going to keep my thoughts about that one the second book to myself because i want this video to just be about the first book only okay so Overall, before I move into the spoiler aspect of this video, it was a good book, okay? I loved it. It was 
it kept my interest in granted i am not a romance person who like at all whether it be uh realistic or fiction at all i'm not a human romance person it's cute when it happens i do enjoy it when it happens in things like that makes sense first of all in things in books and series that over time the love builds and things like that yeah it happens <laughs> it's cute it's romance but personally that is not my favorite genre and not knowing a lick of what this book was about let alone the entire series i just went in with an open mind and i enjoyed it however it was long to get to the you know the good parts of the book that i thoroughly enjoyed um if you're like me if you don't really like the whole filler aspect of it like in anime where there's a bunch of filler episodes and things like that then maybe this isn't for you because it is a slow book at least in the two first two thirds of the book for me i just picked it up because i needed something different out of my like normal day-to-day -day reading stuff which was like science fiction action and adventure drama because i do watch dramas once in a while and this just kind of like spiced things up kept him kept me or helped me get back into reading so to speak as i you know after i read this book i went to youtube to look for like-minded people who th might have thought the same as i did but only to be disappointed and come face to face with so many people who just shat on the book and completely dissed it for things that I thought that it was self-explanatory in the book. It just really, really set my my anger off, <laughs> and I wanted to have a, to give my two cents in as a way to defend that this was a good book because I have not seen or heard about anything good about the book or the entirety of the series. And then again, I'm not I'm not done with the series, so I can't give my two cents on that yet. But hopefully, I will. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to give a positive outlook, which is not normal for me, by the way, for this for this book and hopefully the series, because I am the type of person who likes to fan girls and freak out and just ah <laughs> and just squeal in anticipation of what's going to happen next. <laughs> so, without further ado, let's get into the review. <laughs> that was so lame. <laughs> if you do not want to be a spoiled, I suggest you click off the video now and go read the book or... You know, it's up to you if you want to spoil yourself or hear what I have to say if you already read the book. I don't care. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just here to give my two cents and back up this book because it's really, really good. <laughs> you will see that I agree with a lot of things that these book talk reviewers had to say, which is mostly negative. However, I rather give an explanation as to why, because I felt like because when I saw the reviews and rants on this book, they were leaving out details that would been good explanation as to why they didn't like the book. But I felt like they were just, like I said, just shitting on the entire book. And it just didn't really sit well with me. <laughs> before we continue, or before I get into the spoiler aspect of this book, um... I'm going to make a little comparison though because I've seen a lot of reviewers and rants uh, compare this book to Beauty and the Beast and I do not think that is a genuine comparison. So um, in my opinion, I believe the better comparison to Akatar is Eros and Psyche's story from Greek mythology because they're, they have similar plots. Both stories have three beautiful daughters belonging to a wealthy man with the youngest not perceiving herself as beautiful 
the youngest being taken by an immortal being who she cannot gaze upon his face invisible servants to the mortal wo woman who serves her a jealous immortal woman who despises the relationship between a mortal and an immortal so much so that when confronted by the young maiden she sits challenges for her to overcome as punishment all for the sole reason of the young maiden wanting to see her immortal lover once more and spoilers but both ladies turn into a powerful immortal being after being resurrected from the dead <laughs> i mean it became very apparent to me the more that i read akutar that this was just a retelling of eros and psyche and i would like to think that maybe that is why i thoroughly enjoyed the book because <laughs> I watched Ruby. I read the uh, Sin, uh, the Lunar series, which is Cinder, Cress, Scarlet, and Winter retellings of Cinderella, Snow White, Red Riding Hood, and Goldilocks. But sci-fi, like, <laughs> I like retellings. Okay, I like to see people take old folklores and fairy tales and put a spin on it and see what they can come up with and enter. And maybe intertwine a few of them into one big world of their choosing but that's just me and if you're like me then this is the book for you in the series as well i suppose but you know outside of that the second book is it goes into its own i think from the second book on i think it becomes its own thing but for this for the first book only, I think it's just a retelling of Eros and Psyche. I truly think so. That Getting that out of the way, um, let's get into more details about the book. I'm gonna start off with the, a little bit of how things were described in the book. I felt that the descriptions were very lackluster and dull because it was a lot of... Um, expectations of what the reader would input at least when you go to Perinthian, which is the fairy realm it is so like for example Pharaoh gets taken to spring court which is takes place in like two-thirds of the book what i mean they were the description for it was mostly flowers and i didn't really see anything besides oh there's a bunch of these flowers oh there's a garden here there's woods here and that was it like come on i expect to see some pixies or some some sprites flying around a little bit just a little if it's the fairy realm give me give me mushroom creatures give me give me fairies shaped as leaves bugs or sprites and things flying around i mean those are fairies as well <laughs> but no it, it barely mentioned any wildlife and that kind of like disappointed me because i had my high hopes a pie <laughs> and i mean it was great seeing the different types of fairies like the surreal the puka the wisps and things like that being mentioned which by the way i am a huge fan of wisps <laughs> um but it was it was just mostly it was very dull in my opinion which is some is which of it i agree with most of the ranters and the reviewers another which i agree with is um there could have been more research done on Feyre's, uh painting hobby because it's mentioned in the book that Farah is a painter she likes to paint unless she had a dream of settling down after her sisters got married to be a painter and just be with her father and live a life of quiet not once did we get a detailed explanation of how Feyre thinks as a painter the entire time she was just in survival mode which is granted because she's in a foreign place that she knows is dangerous and yet would have been nice to see if Feyre was able to let down her guard long enough to let the readers know that she feels safe in Tamlin's court in the spring court but not once that was that given I mean even when she, when Tamlin took her to the gallery and she was examining the paintings there was not really much other than the fact that there were portraits hanging on the wall 
and then even with her own paintings they didn't give much detailed description of how she painted the winter woods painting that Tamlin liked so much in terms of brush strokes and brightness and saturation and contrast of the colors and things like that which granted I know not everybody is an artist who would know this type of stuff unless you went to an art class or an art school um but we have the internet at the time that this book came out the internet was the number one source of information practically at this point that where you can just take a little time out of your day to like check out skillshare or something that gives a maybe 30 minute class over something basic as that moving on to Feyre as a character she is uh something <laughs> we'll just say she's she's not stupid okay i'll give her that many many people seem to think that she is but she's not she is not educated okay she is illiterate she cannot read she, outside of the basic words that she was able to gather from um her early age of eight when before her family was um before her family lost the the fortune to a unfortunate accident on her father's part the authors sarah j maths seem to portray Feyre as someone who has been a survivor for so long that she no longer knows how to put down her hair and just relax which makes sense because as the youngest of the family who was suddenly made to be made to take care of the rest of the family instead of the oldest she probably forgot and just could not do it so it made sense in Perinthian that she was taking Tamlin's and Lucian's and the servants around her all their advice with a grain of salt because she was raised and taught that fairies were not to be trusted and that they lie and that you have to like preserve yourself when faced with a fairy I mean, at one point, Feyre asked Tamlin and Lucian if fairies could lie, to which she finds out they can, because she was told that they cannot. If you, any if you know anything about Celtic folklore in general, especially about fairies, is that the only way a fairy cannot lie is if you have like their true name, I believe, or you trap them, like for example, the cereal in the book, but that's it. It's, it's pretty much uh, the basic fairy knowledge. Um, I'm assuming the high phase are just more closer to being human than they are fairies. Because, uh, I mean, apparently Tamlin's handsome. You could see his cheekbones through or under his mask. So, you know, and like I said, with Feyre being a painter, she was not given a chance to show that part of herself. But, and again, She's ignorant, so she doesn't have the level of education that her sister just does. So I would get- I completely understand that she doesn't know what she's talking about. Because she wasn't taught. And against the better advices of her captor and her- her fairy friends. She kind of just did not have a sense of self-preservation. I mean, when it was proven time and time again to her that the fairies, like the cereal, for example, were not to, be, or not the cereal, the puka, for example, the puka in the book, it appears as her family, because she's trying to return home to the family that doesn't want her, which is dumb, but okay. She goes. And tries to sneak out only to get caught by Tam and, and he warns her again do not trust your senses your sight your smell your touch anything like that because everything in here is meant to deceive you lie to you manipulate you to get to get to you kill you eat you one of the two <laughs> and she just not take that at face value which many many book reviewers have said and I mean, again, I chalked that up to her not trusting anything that anybody says because of what she was told. 
and how she was taught growing up. But moving on to Tamlin, which is our male lead. Tamlin is the High Fey Lord that took Feyre from her home. He is uh, not the best male lead I've ever read. <laughs> I mean, I've read better uh, and I've attempted to write better. So <laughs> this, is, this is a good way of sh showing future writers on what not to do as many people have put it um i thought that tamlin was 2d he wasn't really interesting outside of the fact that he was a lord and he was able to fight and he shapeshifts into this giant bobcat with antlers and once in a while when he gets angry these claws come out like okay not once did we get to see that in action, really, in the book, which it was really sad. <laughs> Other than the last part of the book, but even then, that was like very brief and I was disappointed. Um, He was very secretive with Feyre as well. Like whenever she asked a question, he like pertaining to the fairy world, Perinthian or himself, he kind of just like dodged it or changed change conversations and that didn't really help her much because if he was forthcoming with her i felt like she would have opened up a little bit more and took what he said at face value i mean his right hand lucian was more helpful to her than he was and he was a male lead he was also awkward because when he took favor from the from her home it was like he was a big brute angry beastly thing who showed off his power to her and her family and then when they arrived in perinthian he was suddenly trying to make conversation and make her feel welcome which was strange in my opinion there was like no genuine explanation for that except for right before the last two the last third of the book when it was all info dumped <laughs> in like one chapter, I think. And the last thing about Tamlin that I have about him is that he had no indication of a rom like romantically being interested in Feyre, like at all. I felt like the relationship between Feyre and Tamlin was rushed and there was like a like not a plot but there was something missing that spark between them that would i think would have ignited their love a lot sooner maybe before the cal and my scene but it didn't happen and it, that scene fell flat because of it so that's what I have on the the two lead characters of the book. Moving on to Lucian as a character. This boy. <laughs> Lucian is Tamlin's right-hand man, as I said. He is apparently the emissary or something of that line of Spring Court, but he is not from Spring Court. He's actually from Autumn Court. And he is a wounded baby as later revealed in the book that i think had a mortal love a human lover at one point and it like backfired on him so his thing was that he had a metal eye and a snarky attitude to which i think was very valid towards pharaoh because all of a sudden a human girl is supposed to live in spring court after killing one of their own and it was very realistic towards her at least and i i love the interactions between lucian and Feyre because they had like this banter going back and forth and i love banter when done right so that's what i have on lucian he deserves the world though he, he learning a bit about him and his backstory with his family in this book was just heartbreaking to read and i was hoping the entire time that his brothers would have been killed at the end but nope didn't happen 
And then, you know, you have Alice, who is the servant that was in charge of Feyre, but, like, she was hardly there. I guess her only purpose, really, was to give this chapter-filled info dump of what happened after Spring Court got invaded by the villainous of the book. And yes, you heard right. I said villainous. I mean... Not much was touched upon other than the fact that her... Her sister and her, her sister's husband were killed and she was in charge of these two nephews in a different court. But, you know, one thing led to another and she was trapped in Spring Court because of the curse that's laid upon Spring Court. So she's... I don't know. And then you got Feyre's two sisters, older sisters, I should say, as I mentioned before. Uh, Nesta and Elaine. Nesta is the oldest of the three. She... I felt she was really rude. Okay, let's just be honest. She was rude, and she was greedy. Same with Elaine, but Elaine was not as rude as Nesta was. Um, Nesta was more blunt, I should say. Whereas Elaine was the bubbly airhead who grew a garden and a, a flower garden, mind you, instead of growing fruits and vegetables to help the family survive through the winter. And like, like really? The one thing you guys have in common is the fact that you want to preserve your sister's, your second, second oldest, youngest sister from the harsh reality that they are in? Really? But in the end, you know, before Feyre has to go back to Perinthian because she gets sent home. Feyre was given the nudge she needed to go back to Perinthian. Thanks to Nesta and Elaine. Because without Nesta, um, Feyre wouldn't have that chance to think through her thoughts of what happened in like, say, the past year, I believe. And she... She was the only one, too, who remembered what really happened the night Feyre was taken by the power of strong woman mind. That's basically it. <laughs> I mean, Elaine was still Elaine, but she helped her sister get ready and made it quicker for her to go back to Perinthian by getting the horse and supplies she needed to go back. They kind of redeemed themselves for me a little bit at the end. It's, you know, but it's not forgiven because of how they treated Feyre. I'm not gonna really add much about the father because he was like worse than Alice. He was like mentioned maybe four times in the entire book. <laughs> you know, in the beginning when she's when Feyre is talking to him about Nessa's potential marriage and then towards the end where he's suddenly back to his own self because he has money and wealth and i'm like yeah this this dude is mm, yeah yeah your family sucks Feyre. good not gonna lie <laughs> i mean we don't even know his name we don't even know what title he was either which was a letdown because it would have told me at least how far from wealthy had they fallen right Nah. <laughs> but moving on to the two villains of the story. Or supposedly two villains. We have Amarantha and Rysand. Let's talk about Amarantha first. Amarantha. Whew. This evil witch. <laughs> I have not read a villain like her in a very long time if not at all really and i mean this in a sense of her being evil because she just loves to torture people whether they're human or fairies i mean at one point there is this i think summer fairy who had wings he had come into spring court and like a bloodied mess and everything carried by tamlin saying she cut my wings she cut my wings and at that point i was going who's this she do we have a villain and is it a girl really so i was excited but they never once revealed her name until like i said alice giving the big huge chapter filled info dump before the last third of the book it was kind of like the he who shall not be named kind of thing right but in the sense of her hobby of torturing people, it was really well written and it was like 
I think one of my favorite parts of the book as well <laughs> because when you meet Amarantha for the first time under the mountain there is a description of her holding a or having a ring on her finger and a finger on a piece of string wrapped around her neck and in the ring however that's what drew my attention was the ring the ring had an eyeball in it and it moved and the way that it was described in the book made me shiver at the the who yeah i made myself do it <laughs> Woo! it still gives me shivers it was evil she was gloating at the fact that she was she had this human male who had fallen in love with her sister trapped in the ring because he betrayed her sister her sister's love and her and killed her sister i believe right in front of her too so she's a very vengeful spiteful fairy woman which is great right you would think it would be great but as the last third of the book goes on she started to like fall flat and she was also contradictory which was very disappointing let me go in a little deep dive about her character description or her character as a whole so the whole reason why she's the villainous the main big bad person of the book is because she had a sister her name was i think Clamithia or something like that and Clamithia had fell in love with Jurian who was a mortal a human being and this all happened during the great fairy human war that happened five centuries ago in the timeline and she out of love for her sister and marantha warned her that there was a chance that jurian who was this human male there was a chance that jurian was using clamithia to win the war and she was right and it ended up getting her uh it ended up her sis it ended up having her sister clamithia getting killed by jurian and out of spite and hatred for humanity because of him she trapped his soul along with his eye, took his finger, and placed his soul and eyeball into a crystal ring that she then uses as proof to show to him that love between a human being and a fairy cannot exist. As mentioned, I believe, with Lucian, I think Lucian had a, a human lover as well, and when faced with Amarantha, she... When faced with Amarantha, he, like, stood up against her and it ended up... with him getting his eye taken out and thus being replaced with the metal eye that's blurring and everything. So, with that being said, Amarantha... had a big old crush on Tamlin, but Tamlin said no! I don't like you, you're not the one I love, da 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 da, whatever. So because she got rejected, boohoo, big whoop, she ended up throwing a big party in an attempt to to um, rekindle their friendship and the relationship between her court and his court. And it just, it was just a big trap for the entirety of Spring Court and Tamlin because she didn't place a curse upon Tamlin for 50 years where the masks that they wore at the ball to her court all those masks on the fairies cannot be removed unless the curse was lifted the way to break the curse was to have a mortal girl who had a deep hatred for fairy kind kill one of their kind and then have the fairy lord which was Tamlin court said girl to the point where she would verbally say i love you to him that's it that was the entirety of the info dump that alice had given which was dumb because the curse lasted for 50 years and not once were they able to reveal anything about the curse and yet here's alice giving a big huge info dump of the entirety of the curse after the due date of the curse has ended 
and she was still told she was and Feyre was still told by Alice that she was not allowed to give too much details and yet she gave a huge chapter filled of details about the curse it was just as if there were the author Sarah J Mass completely forgot about this small detail of the book which can happen I could see that happening but you know it's it's this is where editors should have came in I believe in my opinion or someone who, an outsider who was not the writer or the author which is the same thing come in and say hey i think this would have been better if you mentioned that early on or just took it out altogether because yeah that didn't really work well it was it was a very confusing plot I mean, Feyre had a chance to, and she was going to. I was literally talking to my book, my copy of the book, going, tell him you love him. Tell him, say the words, I love you before you go, please, because you know you're not going to see him again. <laughs> nope, didn't happen. Not once. But in the entire book, she does not say I love you to Tamlin. Tamlin's the one who said, I love you. And that once has she said it back. And I'm like, really? Not even at the end of the book when everything is said and done. It was not never said. And I was like, such a letdown. <laughs> and Amarantha was contradictory in a in a different part of the book. But I will get to that in a little bit because that goes into big bad fight between Feyre and Amarantha. Which nah. Let, let me at least get through the characters real quick before we move on to that part. Um, so the last, but not least, my favorite character of the entire book, which it was surprise. I was surprised to actually find out who was my favorite once I was finished. Ryson, the High Lord of Night Court. This dude! <laughs> this fairy lord okay when he was first mentioned during kalan mai okay to which by the way kalan mai is like spring equinox for the spring court and i will get to that I'll get into more of that detail in a little bit when he was introduced Feyre describes him as pale tall dark and handsome man with Blue eyes so blue that they were violet, and I'm like... Okay, something's wrong. <laughs> I was like, nope, don't trust you for as far as I can throw you, man. Bye-bye. Quítate. Sacate. And... It was later revealed, too, before the last third of the book, that Rysan was Amarantha's pet. I'm saying pet because I don't want to say the other word that was used. And which was very disappointing because I liked him a lot. <laughs> and, you know, it turns out there was a reason behind it, but I digress. So when Ryzen was introduced, he was a cheeky, mysterious son of a biscuit who threw me in for a loop. <laughs> he was more fleshed out than Tamlin. And he was very calculating as well i mean while under the mountain he was over here playing 3d 4d 5d chess while everybody else was still playing checkers At the entire time that he was more present in the book in the third part of the book i was more intrigued to learn more about rysan than i was about concern about tamlin that's that was something I did not think would happen in a book. <laughs> like, the, the second lead character overshadowing the male lead? What? The, granted, I'm always re rooting for the side couple more than the main couple, but like, dang, this threw me in for a loop. The, way, the reason why I said he was playing 3D, 4D, 5D chess compared to everybody else was because this dude made a deal with Feyre at one point that benefited him okay 
But I'll get to that in a bit because that goes into the fight between Ephaira and Amarantha. The one thing I didn't really like much about him was the fact that he was promenading Ephaira around under the mountain in Amarantha's court in this clad, very scandalous outfit and had Ephaira painted blue as to discourage other fairies from touching Ephaira or in other words Bryson would know that Feyre has been touched <laughs> and he also got her drunk off her butt to the point that she was performing these scandalous dances in front of so many fairies and especially Tamlin and she had no memory or recollection either but apparently you know at one point it was revealed that he never really touched her outside of her hips like hands on the waist kind of thing and that was it so that told me that he wasn't doing it on purpose well he was but not in the lustful kind of way purpose if you get what i mean he had respect for Feyre. it was very clear from Feyre's trials too. Oh, and about Rice Hand, by the way. I told an acquaintance of mine and my aunt, who both have read the books, that... <laughs> and I'm gonna ruin this for a lot of you. <laughs> when I was picturing Rice Hand, I was picturing Pitch Black from Rise of the Guardians. It completely went over my head that this guy had pale skin. And for some reason, that just popped in my head. <laughs> so I'm sorry and not sorry at the same time because it's hilarious. But yeah, he, that man, woohoo. Let's keep it going. <laughs> so moving on to what I really want to talk about, which is, you know, the last third of the book. So this is where everything's get really heavenly spoiled because I feel like I cannot talk about this without uh, spoiling it. But before we get to the last part of the book, I mentioned Cal Calan Mai, the spring equinox for spring court. It would have been that scene between Pharaoh and Tamlin when, Cal when Tamlin was high off his ass on magic and having a sexy time fest with other female fairies like ew not even with a q-tip my dude no don't and goodness gracious thank goodness pharaoh had said i why why do i want your sloppy seconds <laughs> oh my gosh i was like you girl girl we don't do we not even with the q-tip my girl no but you know that scene in my opinion would have been a lot better if there was some sort of juicy spark between the two before that event like there was nothing I felt like there was nothing it was just all Tamlin trying to get Feyre to open up and and try to get on her side trying to welcome her in an awkward and weird way like my guy <laughs> you didn't even try to understand her really so that's what i have about Ala, Cal and Mai. and another thing about the mask curse that amarantha placed on tamlin in his court was the curse made no sense to me now that i think about it because why would you have a female mortal when you uh, try to break the curse by saying I love you, but when you had faced that in the past with your sister? What? It would I mean, it, it probably would have made more sense if it was Lucian who had a human lo lover or Tamlin giving Lucian's backstory to Tamlin, really. Uh, where Tamlin would have chose a human mortal over Amarantha. That would have made more sense. 
And that would give her more incentive to place the curse upon Tamlin and his court as punishment. Because then that would have, you know, triggered her PTSD of seeing her sister die before her by the human male that took her life, you know? But, nah. It, it's, it's fine. It is what it is. So, the last thing is, you know, talking about the last third of the book. The last third of this book... was just Feyre living under the mountain under Amarantha's rule for three months in an attempt to get Tamlin back and free his court and himself. Um... So Amarantha was like, no, you cannot have him. It doesn't look like he loves you, and I do not believe for a fact that you love him. So here, to prove, to test your love, for my beloved Tamlin or whatever. <laughs> I will give you three trials. And if you cannot solve my, if you cannot finish my three trials, I will give you an out, an easy way out. Solve my riddle and you, both Tamlin and his court will be free from his curse. And I will let them go. However, she did not say that for the three trials, the last part of letting them go. Later revealed. Uh -huh. Um, so the first trial was about this big giant earthworm that they called the Mittengard Mitt Mittengard Worm. Blech. And Feyre having to basically survive in this mud-filled maze while being chased by the worm. And there are bets being placed by the other fairies that are with Amarantha under the court, or under the mountain. And Amarantha was like, I hear you're a huntress, so hunt this. And, you know, here comes the worm. I will say, though, Ryson, this is where Ryson be suddenly became my favorite because he figured out what Feyre was doing, uh, as in trapping the worm to kill it. He figured it out before anybody else because they were like, what is she doing? Ew, why is she putting the mud all over herself? And he was like, she's hiding her scent to trap the worm. And she heard him. So what does she do? She flips him off. <laughs> and then goes fights the worm. <laughs> and the dude smiles. Okay, the dude smiles. He is... And the entire time, I am telling myself, no, 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 do not fall for this man's trickery. He is the bad guy. He is Amarantha's pet. No. <laughs> and then at, in the back of my mind, it was like, yeah, that's a shame. <laughs> so the worm, the mitten garden worm trial was written very good. It was it was so good that uh, when I was reading it, this battle song, Irish song that I had on a playlist on YouTube go. It came on at the right moment and I was like, ooh, this is even better. Let's get, let's read. <laughs> so that was a good, that was a good well-written scene. And then after that, because Feyre got injured, like she, she could not come on scathe. Okay, let me tell you. This is where Ryson's deal comes into play. In... Well... To heal Feyre, Ryson was asked for two weeks out of the month, each month, from Feyre. But Feyre says, no, I'm not giving you that, and I don't need your healing abilities to help me and but even though she was dying this is where her like common sense danger sense thing didn't really kick in much she knew she was dying and she ended up changing her mind she was dying from infection from the nasty caca mud that the worm produced and it was her wound from the worm gotten affected from that so she was dying she was having a fever she was going in and out of consciousness, and she was waiting for Lucian to show up to heal her, but it did not happen. 
So Ryzen stepped in and said, okay. 10 days. She goes, five. He goes, a week then. And done. There you go. He heals her arm and marks her arm. A vine-like tattoo with an eyeball on her palm. And apparently that tethered her and Ryzen together because in the second trial... It was where a test of... It was another riddle, actually, for Mamoratha. But this is strange because not once was it mentioned how Amaratha figured out that Feyre is illiterate. So it was like, did she find out from Lucian, like, the first trial? Because she, she tortured... She kind of tortured uh, Lucian to tell her to tell her what he what she can do and that's how i guess she found out she was a huntress i believe but like it would have been it would have been nice to know if lucian had also revealed that she was illiterate but in the second trial it wasn't just pharaoh's life at hand it was lucian's as well and they were both about to get impaled by hot flaming spikes and became a bloody singed mess <laughs> so because Feyre couldn't read. She wasn't going to be able to pass the, the trial. And that's like the only thing that was like I didn't have. Wasn't really happy with was the fact. How did Amarantha fan, find out she couldn't read? Like who told her? <laughs> it couldn't have been Tamlin. The dude was stoic the entire time. So that one that was like the start of the dwindling part of the end of the book. Because the last trial was just... Pharaoh trying to kill three fairies, right? And these three fairies... were innocent. It... It was as if Sarah J Mass kind of ran out of ideas towards the end here because... Rushed a little- I felt like it was rushed a little bit. And I don't know if this was because of her editors or because she was they they told her she had a specific amount of pages that she could write or something. I don't know. But you know, it would have been better if Pharaoh had stood up against Amarantha at this point and told her, no, I won't do it, because that would have made much more sense in the terms of her being a changed person from when she was in the book because in or in the beginning of the book because in the beginning she was she hated fairy kind she did not trust anybody as far as she could throw him and then towards the end of the book she had lucian as a friend she loved tamlin and she cared for alice and her nephews that would have made much more sense if she had just stood up to amarantha saying no I won't do it, proving her wrong that she has changed as a human and that humans can change and come to a, sort of an agreement and live amongst fairy kind. Especially with the fact that her lover is a fairy high lord. That would have made a much better ending. But, you know, Pharaoh ends up killing two of the three innocents and only to find out that the third was Tamlin himself and because Tamlin can shapeshift, she, he wasn't able to be uh, harmed. Which, by the way, fairies in this book can be only killed by an ash blade or something made of an ash tree. Okay. So the iron doesn't work. Silver doesn't do much either. I mean, it doesn't really attract fairies, but iron doesn't harm them. So. And then there's the thing with the riddle. Amarantha's riddle. It was. It was cliche. Let's just say that. It, 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 she gave this big old riddle, right? Let me, let me, let me pull it out real quick. Here's, here's the riddle. There are those who seek me a lifetime, but never we meet. And those I kiss, but who trample me beneath under grateful feet. 
At times I seem to favor the clever and the fair, but I bless all those who are brave enough to dare. By large, my ministrations are soft-handed and sweet. By scorn, or uh, but scorn, I become a difficult beast to defeat. For those each, for though each of my strikes lands a powerful blow, when I kill, I do it slow. Okay. At first, I thought it was a dragon because of the whole scorn part, but I commend those who are brave enough to find me. Right. It wasn't that. And it was and that whole detail thing about a dragon on a cape that Raisan had given I think it was Raisan? No. Not either Raisan or Lucian who gave Kate Feyre a cape that had a dragon symbol on it. And I was like, hey, maybe it's a dragon. Nope. And then more as I read along, I thought it could be truth. Because the truth is hard to digest for some people. And considering that the fact that Amarantha's sister was um Blinded by love that she could not see the truth. That would have made sense, right? Nah, the answer was love Like literally After Feyre completes the entirety of the trials Amarantha was beating her within the life of her in uh, inch of her life that She wanted Feyre to admit that she does not love Tamlin and she wasn't going to let them free because she didn't promise that for the trials she completed, she only promised it for the riddles. Or for the riddle. And... Did not work, and Feyre just figured out what it was, staring at Tamlin as she's laying there dying, that it was love. Broke the curse, Tamlin killed Amarantha, and... All the High Lords that were under the mountain... Uh, gave... A piece of themselves to to uh, Feyre to revive her into a fairy body with a mortal heart. And it was, that part was a little confusing to read as well because it was it, the way that it was written, it was saying that Feyre was in the eyes of Rysan, but because of the bond, not the bond, the deal they made in the bond that was connected to them because of the deal, it led her to him and she was able to see through his eyes what she looked like laying there dying or dead and the other high lords and Raisen himself giving her a piece of their power to resurrect her from the dead and that turned her into an immortal fairy too so that's a plus i guess but yeah, that is my overview in rant of the Court of Thorn and Roses. I hope this was as insightful and good enough for me to explain why I like the book and why I think many people, many more people should read it. Give it a read if you are over the age of 18, mind you. I do not recommend this for minors. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm just hopeful that I was able to get my point across and hopefully give some context evidence and proof from the book itself, even though it was off the top of my head, of why Feyre was the way that she is. Why she was such an annoyance to most people and why Tamlin and the other characters were the way they were. But it, it's... One of my new favorites right now, and I'm going to continue reading the series. <sighs> I'm such a busy bee. Wait a minute, I'm not a bee. I'm a cat. <laughs> yeah, I thank you guys so much for watching this video. And if you have any comments or concerns or just want to rebuke my argument, by all means, go ahead and leave a comment down below and share what you thought. If you like the book, you hate the book. Why did you hate the book? Uh, was it because of the characters, the setting, description, or multiple things? Just let me know and we can have a little discussion in chat. Okay. I don't mind. This is the whole point of having a... a, a... Have you ever been in a book club? You're supposed to have a little discussion about this. <laughs> well, about the book you read. 
So that's what we're doing here. And I encourage you guys to strike up a conversation into the in the comments. Just don't fight. <laughs> Keep it civil. Keep it calm. Okay? Let's 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 keep it going, right? Let's be nice to each other. So I don't want to be seeing seeing any people calling people names in the comments. Okay? And leave a like. Subscribe if you like. I'm not here what to tell you what to do. But hey, if you like the video and you like to see more, uh, stick around and find out and you'll see what goes on in this little channel of mine. And I will catch you guys in the next one. Matanya!